Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Reading Party Podcast with Megan and Lexi. This episode continues our season looking at stories inspired by or set in ancient Egypt. Some of the material includes themes of violence or sexual assault. It is not suitable for under 18s. We hope you have your favourite beverages and snacks ready to go, because we've got our teas and are ready to start spilling the tea on our latest ancient story. So the quest? Yes, I finished reading it at some point, and I just remember thinking, "Man, I don't love this as much as I thought I did." Mm-hmm. Because I don't know if it was like the age I was, or the fact that because I hadn't formally gone to school as a classicist yet, like that I just didn't realize how problematic. I don't know what it was. Like the memory I had of this was that I I liked it. Mm-hmm. Oh dear. No, not anymore. Oh, dear. Yeah, I was going to say. So as a first time reader, what did you think? As a fiction, mystical, like high fantasy novel, I guess, set in ancient Egypt, it's fine. There's a lot of problematic things that really are echoed, I think, in everything else we've said about every other book we've read in this series, there are some weird race essentialist things going on. There is a lot of everyone outside of Egypt are cannibals or some kind of like savage living out in in the African wilds. And it's super racist. And the weird relationship between Lostris and Titer comes back again, except this time it's possibly worse. I'm not sure because Lostris has been... Okay, we, we should start, start way back at the beginning. It opens with Taita in some, maybe India, somewhere, not Egypt. And he's going through like magical rituals to expand his consciousness and become this amazing, like enlightened being, which... Okay, sure, fine, whatever. Except that it is weirdly sexual and apparently knowledge is passed on through sex. So when the Supreme Grandmaster dies, he has sex with his number one acolyte and gives her, through his magical semen, maybe all of his wisdom and experience. Who knows? And then you find out that the the big bad guy in this particular book is a witch named Eos, who steals people's magic through her magical vagina when they have sex. So there's a lot of, of weird, weird sexual stuff going on already. And then Taita like journeys back to Egypt and there are all these plagues going on and you find out that Eos is acting through these henchmen trying to kind of take over Egyptian religion. And the queen has been caught up in this because in all of the plagues and famines that have happened, she's lost a child, which fucking sucks as someone who has lost a child. And they're using this to like manipulate her and try and get access to the pharaoh. And it all ends up with Taita going off on this journey to find the witch and and defeat her and do all that good, exciting stuff. On the journey, they go out of of Egypt and into like wilds of Africa. It's all very uncivilized and and weird and again, racist. And they find a group of cannibals. Fascinating. Except one of the cannibal children is somehow Lostris reincarnated. And at that point, I gave up all hope of any redemption for this particular book. Or indeed the series as a whole, because you know, you know, somehow it's going to be weirdly sexual, despite the fact that she is, again, a literal child. And he tries, like Wilbur Smith tries to get around it by saying that, oh no, she has all of like the maturity and the wisdom of the adult Lostris when she died. I'm like, ah, I don't know enough about the theory of reincarnation to know if that's how it works, but she's a literal child, again, a literal child with Taita being all in love with her and weirdly possessive and very jealous when the other men in the camp give her shiny baubles because she's a a cute kid and they want to make the cute kid happy. And he's like, oh my God. Oh, 
Okay, good. Fantastic. So there's that whole mess that it doesn't end well. I mean, it, it, I guess for the characters, it's supposed to be a happy ending. Taita magically gets his penis back. Yes, so that happens. And he defeats Eos again with this weird sex thing. And then Taita finds the Fountain of Youth because, of course, he does, drinks it, becomes a young man. So he's, he's young. He has his penis back, which is amazing. And then they, like, they go back to Egypt. And at the end, Taita leaves with the girl Fen, who is lustrous reincarnated. He leaves with her to find the Fountain of Youth again so that she can become immortal. And presumably they can live forever in this really weird, semi-pedophilic relationship. Yeah. I've glossed over a lot of stuff. It's a long book and we're only doing one episode on it. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, it is also, I'm just like, for such a weird tale, it didn't have to be this long because the book is quite thick. There's a lot of unnecessary travel, like more travel than, well, I already said it was unnecessary, but it's just a lot and a lot of little weird side diversions and side quests. And it doesn't, that don't seem to add an awful lot to the story as a whole. I mean, we knew, right, that any kind of reality was thrown out the window when Taita is a magus who starts the story off at like 150 or something years old. And you're like, what the hell? So you're like, all right. And somehow they remove his eye and perform an operation that opens his third eye. So now he can read everyone's auras. And yeah. When you get to the aura thing, you know what? my mind just kind of went right to Avatar The Last Airbender. And I was like, oh, it's like Ty Lee's weird. Like, your aura has never been pinker. And you're like, hmm, is that the kind of aura he's going to see? It, God, it was disturbing. Yeah, I must admit, I remembered it being the longest pure journey of the series, which I guess in hindsight really shouldn't surprise me. It's called The Quest. I just didn't remember how much like random meandering was present. I definitely didn't remember the spirit of Lostris playing such a big role. I just, oh. <laughs> I mean, normally she's like a mention. Normally it's like, and I looked into the desert and I caught a glimpse of what I thought to be her face. You know, like, remembered I thought it was like that, but, but this is a lot more present than, ooh. She's come man. back to life, man, and, and she's there physically all the time. I mean, just the whole, like, and Fen is the reincarnation of her. And so, like, ergo, not only does he get another chance, but ergo, like, she's not really dead. Ergo, I, you step into this protective role. I just, wow, I didn't remember. Can we revisit that she is a literal and actual child again? Is this a child the way that Helen is a child was a child in <laughs> Helen of Troy? No, because she just so obviously wasn't a child in Helen of Troy. This is just she's a muddy small child. This one is a dirt. child. Yes, that's how children should be. It's how I was as a child, always covered in dirt. My children are always covered in dirt. It's how you know they're children. I think she's a child. This is just weird. Well, I mean, I guess it depends because, you know, children these days are so pampered and spoiled that there's like, isn't the point for a lot of parents that like, my child should never be in the dirt because, ew, it's unsanitary and I must protect them from all the gross germs. And I, you're like, I well, haven't actually come across that in parents. I'm sure it exists because it's such a trope. I'm sure it has to exist somewhere. But most small children I, I come across are just, even if it's not like outdoor dirt, They've spent the day drawing on themselves or they're covered in food or they're just, they're dirty. It's, it's a small child thing. Maybe it's more like if you live in the big city thing, because then there's like the, ooh, it's the big bad dirty city. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I come from Chicago, but I definitely have run into or met or seen or heard from some of the parents who are like, my child must be in a sterile environment at all times. And if there's like yeah, we dirt do. anywhere... No. no, you know, and they're like coming in with the sanitizing place. spray. Yeah. yeah, so I think that's fine. I was trying to think of something really clever to say about this book, but you know what? I can't muster it. What I can say is I am not sure if I'm glad I had to reread it, but I kind of am because maybe I wanted, I, I needed to reread it to take the shine off of what I thought 
it was because it had been so many years since I did read it. And I really would hate to recommend this to someone without remembering the full picture. So I guess I'll say I, I'm very glad that I did, but good God, I don't remember why I wanted to read this. This felt like a mistake. Well, I think like River God, when we were planning this season, you really wanted to read River God. And I'm glad that I read it. It was a good book and it seemed reasonable. If we're doing a book and we're doing a whole series on Egypt, let's hit as many of those books as we can. Obviously, we skipped Seventh Scroll because I screwed up with the book order thing. And we're, we're gamely making our way through them. But, ah. I hope people, at least, if they don't appreciate, I hope they just give us props for forcing ourselves to continue through this series. Because here's the thing, dear audience members. I just want any excuse to read River God because despite all the things that we went through that make it problematic, it's still a good book, in my opinion. It's still entertaining. I still really loved it. But the more that I reread the series, I think that other than maybe Warlock, I, I'm may, and that's a heavy maybe. I think it would have been a brilliant solo book that didn't need to be a series. Yes. Yeah. I was curious because after I reread the book and was horrified at what I reread, I tried to find some quotes about from Wilbur Smith to see if he gave an interview or said anything. And I don't know if, if you saw, but he was quoted saying about the book from some source that, well, he didn't say it was like his own fanfic, but he essentially was talking about how it was very self-indulgent to like make Taita whole again. And that he was like, Oh, I wanted to restore him, both his youth and his manhood. The entire reason he did it is because he just was so fond of his own character that he was like, well, if it's a series about like witchcraft and magic and spells, he was like, I have the power to do this. Why not? So I was like, okay, well, it's a self-indulgent author, self-indulging his favorite character. And honestly, that's kind of how the book reads. So if you are wanting to read this book, that is how one should read it, which is just an author making his own fanfic, I guess. I think that's the best way to describe it. It's like when I was in high school, I read the Clan of the Cave Bear series, Earth Children. Love them. Beautiful books. As an adult, I've reread them several times, some glaring errors. And I, again, when I was in high school, went and, and read some fan fiction because the internet was a thing way back in the stone age when I was in high school. And it's absolutely wish fulfillment. I don't read a lot of fan fiction, but I assume a lot of poorly written fan fiction is wish fulfillment. And this book reads like decently written, but it's fan fiction fulfilling the wishes of, in this case, the original author, but it's absolutely, like, ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's just meandering. I mean, it's just, it's colonialist meandering. I mean, it's, it's him, like, sending his characters down into, like, a deep and mysterious Africa, and you're like, oh, God. And then it's like, he meets, it's the trouble of smart dude meets like savages in deepest darkest africa and you're like oh my god and then you're like great savior complex i don't you know you know what though i'm gonna take us on a little tangent because you know what this is warranted here because this book felt like a tangent like a weird ex extrapolation of my mind anyway but in terms of like what kind of fanfic this is I mean, it honestly reminded me of Love Never Dies, the sequel to Phantom of the Opera. Because if you've seen that musical or heard it, that's essentially what it is. It's like fanfic for Andrew Lloyd Webber. For those who are unfamiliar with the plot of, well, the original, I guess. I'm going to assume a lot of people know Phantom, but I guess I'll do like a mini, mini, mini recap. Essentially, woman is like terrified by a mysterious, creepy man who calls himself the like angel of music, spirit of her father. Essentially, she like falls in love with dashing guy. Creepy man in mask haunts her, forces her to sing, then like kidnaps her to try to make her be his bride. And then at the end, like lets her go out of guilt, conscience, something unclear. And then she like goes away and then it ends all dramatically. But then Love Never Dies comes in and essentially it takes place like 10 years later. And 
fanfic to the max. Essentially what happens is it's supposed to tell the story that like Christine, our main lady, woo woo from Phantom, sneaked back the night that the original Phantom ends and had sex with Phantom. And then he got her pregnant, but she like wanted to be with him. And then he got scared. So he like left after their one night stand and then like poofed away to New York. And then now 10 years later, she comes back and she has a son and she married the like rich guy who loved her. And the entire thing is like Phantom being like, I want you back, baby come back and sing for me in my show. And then she like does and leaves the husband, but oh no, she like dies and then it's very sad, but he has a son. That's the plot. And I can't believe I just recapped it in like two seconds, but it's all fanfic. And that's why it was like the quest to me. Wow. I had no idea that existed or was a thing. I well, love yes. Never Dies? Yeah. Fascinating. I'm gonna have to go and find it now. But here's the kicker. The music of Love Never Dies is so fire. Like, it's so good. Essentially, it's very divisive among the fandom for Phantom of the Opera. And as a big musical theater nerd, I'm involved in all the drama. No, I'm kidding. But still. Yeah, so basically, all the fandom agrees. Like, it's just pure fan fiction. Some people are like, it's good fanfic. Some people are like, it's terrible fanfic. People don't like the fact that, like, spoiler alert, not spoiler alert, Christine dies. But, like, everyone agrees the same thing, which is how can such, like, a bad story with such a bad plot have such great, like, music that is just fire? And that's honestly kind of what the quest is, except without the music. So there's nothing to make it, like, straight fire. You're just like, oh, this is just bad fanfic. So it's like if Love Never Dies had shitty music, then you'd be like, this is un bearable but that's really where my brain went so the entire time i was reading this i was like love never dies love never dies and apparently my brain took that one step further and then essentially when lost just came back i was like oh my god love actually never dies because she's here she is here she's reincarnated but her spirit is here i think i'm just gonna start a train and be like this book is love never dies in more ways than one like this is what it is so i think i've Oh, no, I don't want to attach a bad book to, like, an actual <laughs> sequel that I kind of like. Oh, no, what did I do? Megan, why didn't you stop me? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let's say it's, like, the bad version of Love Never Dies, except about a completely different plot in a different media. It's all different, except that it's awful. And it's not even Egypt-based. It's which not. Which is even worse. Like, we go through Egypt briefly, and... Yep. That's the thing. It like feels random that it's like the Egyptian, it's called the Egyptian series. And I'm like, but you're not even in Egypt. What essentially makes it Egyptian is the characters are from Egypt and that's it. Embark on a digital expedition unlike any other with hit points and history. Dive into the captivating realm of Archeo gaming from the comfort of your screen at our virtual Archeo gaming conference. Join academics, professionals, and gamers of all levels on an interactive journey through live streams, workshops, and collaborative gaming events. Whether you're a seasoned adventurer or just starting your quest, there's something for everyone. Your adventure awaits at Hit Points and History, March 9th through 10th. To buy tickets and find out more, head over to hitpointscon.com. That's hitpointscon, H I T. P O I N T S C O N dot com. They're from Egypt, and I think it's like they're all always trying to either save Egypt or get back to Egypt, or even though they're not in Egypt, the country is kind of like its own character in all of the books. But it's. It's, it's like an bad. omnipresent feeling more than it is a tangible place which i don't love but also i'm like well it kind of makes sense because if you're big into like egyptomania it's like a state of mind more than it is a real place because you fantasize about it so i'm like actually it makes perfect sense and maybe i'm just ragging on egypt again because surprise surprise or maybe not i did the bad thing and i was like trolling around on twitter last night i don't know why but guess what? The Darnells are back in the news. And so it brought oh, up Jesus all this God. like weird 
Egypt stuff. And for those audience members who don't know the Darnells, you can look up their very shady story, but they're essentially a pair of Egyptologists who had a whole scandal-ridden career at Yale, but they are apparently also like Instagram stars, which- They dress mark? like 1920 colonialists. And you know, I am a fan of various vintage fashions. 1920 style is gorgeous. I think the problem is that they do it in Egypt, in Egypt, which is famously a country that was colonized by the British around this time. So there's a lot of interesting comments that various people have made about colonialism and white supremacy and all that good stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, if you want to go down this terrible rabbit hole and read something that really makes you furious, because it truly is infuriating, the whole thing. But yeah, go search the Darnells. That's got more Egyptology in it than this book, apparently. But it, it's still also rapid. <laughs> See, I can relate so many things back to this one freaking book that just aren't actually the book because there is more in real life, honestly, that ties back to this idea of Egypt without it being Egypt, which is really sad because this is an Egypt series. And I'm like, why? My brain is going to all the weird rabbit holes. If you can't tell, Lexi and I are both sick as well. So we're sleep deprived and possibly making less sense than we normally do. Yeah, that's Possibly. true. Possibly. I know no one can see our faces, but I'm frequently like turning away to hack up a lung. So there's that too. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's sick brain also just made me have even like less patience with the book, <laughs> but I just needed to get through it. So I was like, okay, let's just go. I don't know. I really, I zoned out and I kind of suspect that like, unless this is your thing and you like stuff like this, I feel like you honestly will zone out too. So I think you kind of know the quality of a book. If you can summarize it in like 20 minutes and just be like, it was bad. And be mildly horrified the whole way through. And guess what? That's kind of what we were able to do. Like this book is so kind of light on anything tangibly valuable and nice and good that Megan and I were able to summarize this book in like 20 minutes. So... Wow, I'm kind of like impressed, but also this shouldn't actually be an achievement. Like, trust me, I want there to be a lot to talk about. I want there to be a lot to analyze because I would love to be able to talk about a good book on ancient Egypt for like two hours. So I think that it kind of illustrates the book's failings. Somehow, though, it was popular enough that he was given a contract for two more books. Yeah, that one is beyond me now Unless i seem to remember contract was in those place were before better. right i seem to remember those were at least a bit more entertaining because i mean well we'll, well see this is titus final outing isn't it he disappears no because he comes, no, he back, comes back because oh lord well because he shifts the timelines around within the series so while well, chronologically there are two more books that come after this one if i remember correctly pharaoh takes place chronologically, I think, after Warlock, is it? I don't remember. All I remember is like, and we'll probably get to it. Oh, God, we'll have to get to that. Oh, dear. But he goes to Crete, and he goes and, like, sees the Minoans, and Taita is not young. He's still kind of like an older man. I don't remember what age he's supposed to be. But he takes two of Pharaoh's daughters and is like, yeah, I'm going to marry them to the Minoan king. So I'm like, I don't remember where chronologically that happens, but like, that's oh the thing. I know. I'm like, oh God. See, the problem is my brain is already going, but the pharaohs didn't send their children. Pharaohs kept their daughters. They didn't marry them off to foreign kings. They took everyone else's daughters and married them themselves, but they didn't. Oh, dear. okay. I was like, look, man, the only close thing in history I can get to is Ankhus and Amun. I mean, Okay, yeah, so she was married to Tut, and like, yeah, her husband died, so, but she's the only known case where I can remember, and this may just be a gap in my Egyptological learning, but I'm like, well, she sent the letter to the Hittite Hittites. king, and was like, I need to be married, but even then, she was like, send me one of your sons to Egypt to marry me, and yeah. that's why he was, like, murdered on the way, supposedly. I'm not an Egyptologist, I'm sure that at some point it happened, but when you look at Egypt's relationship with the international community, especially during the Bronze Age, it doesn't happen. 
they get women sent to them, they don't send their women out. Yeah, so I was kind of like, from what I, if memory serves, it was like Egypt was down on its luck, was poor or destitute, I guess. And like, that was the reason that Pharaoh sent his daughters away. I don't remember. It's not historically accurate, but guess what? None of these books are. And the closest one was River God. And that one was where we had the most to talk about. So I'm glad that we started with that one. I'm glad that one was first because it really is devolved. There's nothing Egyptological really about this book, which is a tragedy because I'm like happy that we reread it just so I could like say it's terrible and now get this good memory I once had of it out of my brain. But at the same time, it like makes me angry that we had to burn one of our Egypt adaptations on this because we could have actually picked something that had more history in it. So it kind of feels like a wasted read, but that may be just sick brain talking, but I don't know. Do you feel the same? I don't know. The thing is, the writing is decent. He's got a really great way of describing the places they're traveling through. He writes characters really, really well. I hate the relationships he makes those characters have, but I think he's a good writer. It's just that for a book in a series called the Egyptian series, I had maybe anticipated a, a little, a, like a scooch more Egypt than we got. And at this point, the whole thing is just, it's a high fantasy novel set in an imagined, and, and all, it's not like River God was the most historically accurate thing we've ever read either, but it did a damn sight better than this. It was an imagined Egypt, but it was an imagined Egypt rooted in reality. This is just, we're only in Egypt for a whole two minutes, so it's like... Yeah, I think you're right. That is what I think kept me coming back to every new book he would write, which is just that, yeah, he's a good writer. Like, he actually writes with artistry. I just wish it weren't so graphic, because it just feels gratuitous at this point. But, like, if he toned that down, like, he would be an excellent writer that I'd really want to keep coming back to. So I think it's... Yeah. I am interested to see... Knowing now that Desert God and Pharaoh are chronologically behind what we've just finished, I am interested to see if he reigns in some of the magic stuff a little bit. He doesn't, there's a, Lexi just made a face which suggests that he doesn't. No, just because I, I can't remember. Like, mm. I know that, like, the magic is still there. Like, Taita still has souped up powers of sensing things and knowing things. I do think it might be a little toned down from the quest. I just, I can't confirm how because much Warlock, toned down. Warlock obviously was very heavy on the magic, but it felt more coherent, I think, within the framework of the story and of the world that Wilbur Smith created. The quest felt different. It felt very out of place in regard to what else we've read from him. And it just felt like a step further somehow. So if, if Pharaoh and, and Desert God are more in keeping with Warlock, I think I'll probably find them easier reads. I mean, look, even Wilbur Smith was like, look, it was a clear change of pace. He wanted it to be different. I found an old publisher's weekly review that basically just said that like, this is the book where Smith tries to blend some history, fantasy, and mythology. But the review was basically saying like, if you're a newcomer, it's full of mutilations and grisly deaths. And you're like, oh, okay, cool, thanks. So that's really kind of what this one was. So I don't know. I wish I could say I was looking forward to the other two, but I'm kind of like, oh God, it's starting to feel like a drag. But at the same time, I'm like, well, we're living up to our brand, which I feel like should be like a sub tagline to our show's tagline, which is like, we read and watch them so you don't have to. Because, oh true. my God, like after this, I'm like, please, who's going to want to read these books? Not I. No, no. Oh God. Well, okay. What are we doing next week, Megan? We have Cleopatra. Amazing. We have two episodes on Cleopatra and this is the 1963 movie with Liz Taylor. And the first episode is going to be Lexi and I talking and discussing the movie and the fascinating costuming choices, among other things. 
And then the following week, we are going to be talking with the wonderful Dr. Cara Cooney. If you're unfamiliar with Dr. Cooney, you are in for a treat because that was just, she's always a delight to talk to. Absolute delight. So she'll be giving an Egyptological perspective because it's been a couple of weeks since we had an Egyptologist on the show. So that's what we're going to be doing. And I don't actually have anything else to share about the quest. Unfortunately, this is a really light episode and I'm very sorry to listeners for that, but there's only so much to say. Right? Like there's only so much you can say and there's no history to dig into. So I just, sorry guys, it's a shorter one, but this is, it just shows you that like you can't save a bad book. (laughs) Ha ha ha. Yeah. The good thing is we have a lot of Cleopatra material and it's very in-depth, I think. So I think we make up for it. Yeah, I do too. All right, guys. Well, thanks for bearing with us. Oh, and yeah, look up Love Never Dies if you like musicals because that's great. (laughs) And then I will make sure that Megan and I put in the correct link in the show notes because most people don't know there are two official ways that you watch Andrew Lloyd Webber's musicals. The 25th anniversary version of Phantom that was filmed in 2011 at Royal Albert Hall is the official way. And they filmed an Australian production in Melbourne. So it's the Australian cast. 2012, I believe. And there is an official link to it on YouTube. And that is, according to Weber, the official way to watch the sequel. So everyone, go find that if you like these goals. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for sticking with us. Make sure to join us next week for our take on the 1963 Cleopatra movie. Yes, that one with the blue eyeshadow. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a review. And you can also follow us on social media at The Reading Party Podcast. If you'd like to leave us a book or movie suggestion, then email us at thereadingpartypod at gmail.com. See you next week. (laughs) 